I never intended for there to be so many of these books, but as I started writing them, um, I just started to really love the characters and love the world and really want to write more and explore more. You know? and, and like, honestly, that's sort of my approach to a lot of things in my life. Oh, live on a boat? Sure, why not? Oh, write six books? Sure, why not? Let's give it a shot. Do you love science fiction and fantasy books? You found yourself in the right dimension. Welcome to the greatest podcast in the multiverse, where each week I talk to science fiction and fantasy authors about myth, magic, and the infinite possibilities of storytelling. I'm your host, Herman Stuernagel, and I will be taking you on a journey with some of your favorite authors, helping you to get to know them and possibly uncover some new literary gems along the way. Ready to explore? Because on this show, every conversation is a doorway into a different world. So welcome back to the greatest podcast in the multiverse. I am really excited to have my guest today, Liz Shipton. She is here to talk to us about her books, about dystopian fiction, and a little bit about pirate life. So welcome here, Liz. Hi, thanks so much for having me. You're very welcome. (laughs) I'm excited to have you. Um, Can you start off by just telling us a little bit about who you are and your writing journey so far? Sure. Um, So as Herman said, my name is Liz Shipton. I... My official tagline, I guess, if you want to call it that, is I'm a part-time author, full-time pirate. I live on a boat with my boyfriend and my dog, and we're currently, I say sailing around the world, but we're more sort of like meandering around the world on a sailboat uh, very slowly. And I'm turning my real-life adventures, sort of using that as fodder for the books that I am writing. Yeah, and what an exciting life to turn into <laughs> Not, i think everyone dreams of living on a boat but most people don't get to um so let's start with let's start with that actually what made you decide to live on a boat how did that come about and um, how has it influenced your writing uh man great question um so we i think we kind of decided to to pursue this life almost probably eight years ago at this point it was a long time in the making um my boyfriend was working as a sailing teacher in San Diego. We were living down there and we were going to school and he got a job or he worked a couple of summers as a skipper in Europe doing this uh, like this boat thing out there called Yacht Week. And while he was out there, we kind of got it into our heads that it would be fun to live on a boat. Um, and then combined with the fact that where we are from in California, housing is sort of just insanely expensive. And the thought of us ever being able to afford to buy a house where we were living in Santa Cruz just seemed sort of crazy and and seemed like even if we did do it, it would just be the kind of thing where we were just working for our mortgage for our entire right. lives and would never have, you know, sort of the opportunity to do anything else. So the more we talked about it, it started out as like, well, we could live on a boat, it'd be cheaper than a house. And then it became like, well, if we're gonna live on a boat, we might as well take it somewhere. And then it sort of snowballed into, into this, let's sail around the world plan. Right. Um, and so, yeah, we we just kind of started working and made that our, our sort of North Star that we were kind of working towards for about five years. And then eventually we had saved up enough to, to buy the boat and to feel like we had a bit of a, you know, a bit of a cushion or like a sort of a nest egg um, under us. And yeah, and then we... We just cast off and, and set sail about two years ago at this point. Very cool. So you've been sailing. Okay. So you've been sailing for two years. It's been an eight year process in the making. And obviously mm-hmm. you both had careers that you were able to um, work remotely while, while you travel. I do. Um, okay. I do. So, well, actually that's, so now Trev, my partner's name is Trev. Um, he was an electrician in Santa Cruz. So okay. not, not super easy to find paid work, but what, the way we kind of split it up was like, I work remotely for the money. He works on the boat and sort of maintains all of the systems and does all of the electrical work and all of the stuff that I don't understand, frankly. Um, (laughs) And that was kind of, we, we always kind of joke that I'll keep us floating financially and he'll keep us floating, like literally floating. Love it. Love it. (laughs) Yeah. So how has, um, how has boat life then? Um, this, we're going to actually, let's back up just a step here. Um, but talk to me about your writing journey. When did you start writing and what, what does your publishing career look like to this point? 
Yeah, so I started writing up right around the time that we left. I think I had sort of started writing the first book before before we actually started sailing, but the bulk of it happened on that first year. Um, or yeah, I guess book one was sort of like the first year that we were sailing from Santa Cruz down the Pacific coast um, of the United States into Mexico, down Baja, California, and then continuing on down through Mexico. Um, and then from there, we've gone farther through Central America. Um, but yeah, it was it was me kind of always thinking, as a lot of people do, I think, oh, it wouldn't be great to write a book one day. And sort of having always had that in the back of my mind that one day I'll, I'll write something. And, and kind of realizing that this life that we were choosing to pursue was going to open up the opportunity for me to do that because um, it's a fairly cheap lifestyle. I can afford to support us working um, mostly part time and realizing that I was going to have time to write and to kind of make it happen and that if I wanted to do it like now was the time I guess. So yeah um, a lot of book one I <laughs> I wrote uh, on my phone, like in the middle of the night when I was on watch, like on the Pacific coast, at the, sort of between the hours of like 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., um, just, you know, writing away, trying to keep myself awake. Um, That's awesome. And yeah, and then from there, once I had written the first book, kind of just realized that there was more to the series that I wanted to do and just kind of kept going. <laughs> and yeah. Very cool. So how many books do you have published now? Um, at the moment, there are uh, five. So there's oh. a main trilogy, and then there, there are two prequels. One of the prequels is like a sort of a double feature novella with two, two shorter books in it. And then the other prequel is like an origin story for the villain in the main trilogy. Awesome. Um, and a, all of those books have been published. So it took me a long time to write book one. And then once I had written book one, the rest of them came a lot easier. Um, and then I, I set myself a challenge actually over this last summer that I wanted to try and write two books in three months, which was insane. And I don't think I'll ever do it again, but um, and I did it. And awesome. um, so, yeah, so I just published the first of those two books in September. And then I'm publishing the next one in November. And that will be the last one I published for this year. Right. Um, from here, I'm not planning to probably publish as many books in a year ever again. It was sort of <laughs> crazy, but, right. um, but I'm glad I did it. You know, now they're out there and people are reading them. So, yeah, that's great. awesome. That's very cool. So, did you write all of them on your phone? No, no. <laughs> I wrote okay. large portions of book one on my phone and I'll sometimes write on my phone if we're doing like a long passage. I don't know why, for some reason, um, writing on the phone, I don't get as seasick as I do oh, really? writing on the laptop. And it's also okay. a little easier sitting, sitting with a laptop like on your lap while the boat is moving and it's all kind of going like this. It's just like yeah. not super easy. So when we're actually underway on a passage and I want to write, I'll usually do it on my phone. Other than that, I'm usually on the computer. When you're on your phone, what program do you use? Uh, Google Docs. Just That's Google pretty Docs. much, I write all okay. my first drafts in Google Docs. And then I export, because I like I like the sharing aspect. So I can I can share a Google Doc, you know, with my beta readers and my ARC, well, not my ARC readers, but my beta readers or writing, you know, partner. And feedback is really easy to do. So I really, I like that. And then I will export the rough draft as a, word and import it into vellum and then i'll usually do like editing and the rest of the process in vellum okay cool yeah i was just wondering um and i guess google docs will make it um make it easy to go between your phone and your computer as well yes yeah although i did when i was first starting out <clears throat> i didn't know anything about margins uh and it doesn't matter now that i'm formatting in vellum but the first oh my god first couple books i wrote Tabs and spaces and margins were such a nightmare because I hadn't set everything up properly in Google Docs, especially if you start on the phone. It's like impossible to, or maybe mm. it's not impossible, but it was for me. It was like impossible to set those margins. And then I remember having to go through when I was still using pages and having like exported everything to pages and having to manually go through and like put uh, 
you know, like indents into every paragraph, like by hand for a hundred thousand words. Oh, wow. Wow. Oh, God. Oh, painstaking, yeah. painstaking. Really and of body. course, like, as you said, vellum makes everything so much easier. Um, yes. That, yeah, I mean, you don't have to worry about any of that, or at least not, yeah. not to the extent that you do if you're formatting in Word, so. Yeah. Vellum is yeah. great. Big thumbs up for vellum. <laughs> So two years on a boat, two years writing, is that that's accurate? How is that how has it been for the last couple of years? Like has it how is how has that flow been for you? Like it sounds like the dream life. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like the dream life for sure. Um and I think that's sort of like everyone's uh from the outside, everyone's life looks like the dream life, right? Yes. Um and I it, it is great. I do enjoy it and I'm so grateful that I have the time that I have to work on my books. Um it's just certainly not always easy. I mean, I think, especially in this like day and age of social media, I'm also guilty of like perpetuating this stereotype of like, oh, look, isn't everything fabulous and everything is so wonderful? Because I'm not going to post a video of me being seasick, right? Or like <laughs> right, right. something really terrible. Um, but yeah, it, it's great. I mean, we have seen some truly incredible places. Um, we have anchored in some really amazing beautiful spots um i mean like things that that come to mind are like costa rica where we're literally anchored in a bay and the jungle comes right down to the water and there's monkeys in the mm. trees and there's parrots flying overhead and we're the only people there i mean for miles and miles around and the water is you know just this the most insane color of blue that you've ever seen in your life um so yeah, I mean, there's definitely been some really spectacular things. I would say it's it is a uh, like writing. The highs are high and the lows are low, you know. <laughs> yeah, because you counter that with the sort of like we have to lug our own water back to the boat a lot of the time, right? In cans that hold like six gallons at a time, and so you're you're loading up your dinghy with like five six gallon jugs of water, and then you're pushing it onto the beach, and it's you're getting swamped, and you know, um, right? Yeah. So I mean, it's it's ups and downs as with everyone. Yeah, those yeah, those things that someone looking from the outside may may not be aware of. Are there you know is there anything else that someone looking at uh, boat life that may not have considered that is something unique that you would either either good or bad? Um, I would say that, and and this is something that I did not think was the case before I actually started doing the lifestyle is that you kind of assume, oh, you're going to be out like hiking and swimming and and on the beach and all this stuff all the time. Um, and it's actually, that's actually not true. I mean, so where we've been the last six months, we've been anchored basically in front of a city. Um, and it's a cool city. Cartagena is, is fun. And it's great to be anchored in a city because it's very convenient for us. Like we can go and, and do all the normal city life things that are so nice and easy to do. Yeah. Um, but like the water's too dirty for us to swim, mm -hmm. which is tricky because <clears throat> we don't have air conditioning. It gets very hot here during the day. So we don't really have a good way. Like when we're out at a remote spot and the water's beautiful, you can just jump in and cool off whenever you want. Right. But when you're anchored in front of a city for six months, you don't quite have that Not same so freedom. So things just become sort of more difficult. Um, every, everything that you do, right. You don't have a car. Um, there's just a sort of slight added little bit of difficulty for everything that you that you have to do. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that, that makes a lot of sense. Something that you that you don't see when you're when you're looking at at the mm -hmm. TikToks that look like and I'm sure you're is, having a lot of fun too. Yeah. Yes. To be clear, there is a lot of awesome beach time as well. So. <laughs> well, let's pivot back to your writing for a bit because we're here. To, we are here to talk about your books. Um, I want to start or continue and I want to talk a little bit more about the why in your writing and the motivation behind why you mm -hmm. are a storyteller. So at this point, I would say I'm writing this series because I have fallen so in love with the characters and the world that I, <laughs> it's like, I never intended for there to be so many of these books. But mm. as I started writing them, um, I just started to really love the characters and love the world and really want to write more and explore more. Um, I would say I started writing it, I don't really know, just, I just kind of thought that I would like to try that, 
you know? And, and like, honestly, that's sort of my approach to a lot of things in my life. Oh, <laughs> live on a boat? Sure, why not? Like, let's give it a shot. Oh, write awesome. six books? Sure, why not? Let's give it a shot, right? Like, I don't know if I necessarily have good reasons behind, <laughs> behind anything that I do. Um, it is definitely, yeah, it is definitely very much based on like my life and my experience. And so I think a lot of it was like processing, not only this trip that we are on, cause a lot of the locations in the books and a lot of the sailing stuff that happens in the books and the adventure that happens in the books is all like, I'm drawing very much from like my real lived experiences. Right. So I think a lot okay. of it is, is a way to kind of process that. Um, a lot of it is also a way to process my own sort of personal journey the the main character struggles with her mental health and with alcohol these are things that i have also struggled with um and also my own anxieties about climate change and mm. the looming collapse of society and all that other great stuff that you get to explore in dystopian fiction yeah for sure okay cool um so why don't we talk a little bit more about the series then um, since that is a very good lead in to it. Um, tell us about mm. the classic series and what it's all about. Yeah, so it is a, it started off as a YA dystopian series um, and then sort of grew into a YA dystopian romance. Um, and it is set in a dystopian water world that is sort of like 150-ish years into the future um, on a in a place that is like basically bit meant to be Earth, um, it's sort of set on the Pacific coast of the of North America and Mexico um, primarily. Um, and basically, the main character, whose name is Bird Housley, is this sort of train wreck of a girl who's struggling with alcohol, not doing super great with her life, kind of just messing up and and doing uh, making a lot of bad reckless decisions and she ends up getting herself into trouble and having to flee her hometown and her her long-suffering sailing teacher kind of gets dragged along with her on this like adventure and so they both end up getting on his boat fleeing across this dystopian water world together and you know then from there Hijinks and hilarity ensue. There's pirates and there's crazy weather and there's a evil tech corporation chasing them and all this stuff happens and they fall in love and they save the world and you know, all that, all that great stuff. Um, so yeah, I guess sort of in a nutshell, that's that's kind of the core of the story. Awesome and definitely sounds exciting. Um, that's what you know. I love a good pirate story, especially. So yes, same. <laughs> yeah. Um, so can you tell us a little about a little bit more about the world then? Um, so it's mm -hmm. it's a dystopian world. What's kind of happened? What's kind of what are kind of the events that set them up in this this water world dystopian adventure? Yeah. So twenty years prior to the beginning of book one, there's a massive pandemic that wipes out like the majority of human and and animal life on Earth. Um, the pandemic was exacerbated by the fact that due to climate change, a lot of the world is underwater. Um, and the parts of the world that aren't underwater are pretty much either on fire or plagued by hurricanes or tornadoes or drought or extreme weather of some kind. So there are only eight habitable places on the planet that are still temperate enough for humans to live in. Um, and they're basically, they're called cities or harbor cities, basically, because they provide safe harbor for humanity and they are filled with climate refugees. So the reason that the pandemic was so devastating is because humans are all sort of packed in on top of each other in these eight remaining cities. And there are like refugee camps surrounding the cities where sort of the overflow of humanity has spilled into. Um, so that's kind of like, that's how the world got to be the way it is. None of the, none of the cities have actual city names. <clears throat> but they are all modeled on a real city in the world. So for example, the characters, the main character's hometown is called Broom, and that's kind of loosely based on my hometown of San, Santa Cruz in San Francisco in California. So okay. they live in a place where there's a lot of fog in the air, like it never rains, but the way they get their water is, is through harvesting fog from the air. Okay. Um, the city that they sail to in book one is called Alluvium, and that was based on a city that we spent a lot of time in in Mexico last year, 
uh, right on the southern border of Mexico uh, in the Chiapas region. And that, when we were there, it was, it was kind of the rainy season. And so I found myself a lot of the time sloshing around the streets of this, um, of this village where we were in my flip-flops. And it's hot, super hot and muggy, right. but also raining, and you're walking around in like this much water. So wow. then kind of when I came to, to write the city of Alluvium, I was drawing from that. So the city of Alluvium, everything is up on stilts. Everything is sort of in this like swampy marshland. And um, the city kind of exists in between these like estuaries. And the way they get their fresh water is from the marsh and the estuary. Um, so yeah, it's all kind of... Um, like it's a dystopian water world, but like none of the water is really drinkable except in these like eight cities where it's temperate where people can live. Right. And I think, you know, that is a very realistic reality if you are living in a in a dystopian type world that is on the ocean. Yeah. I was trying very much to to create a world that um, you know, and then with the characters that I that I populated the world with, I'm really trying to make it feel as close to our world, I guess, as it can be without just straight up being like, this is our world. <laughs> right. Well, and I think that that, um, that adds a bit of, obviously, a sense of realism to your story as well. If people can, even if they don't recognize the names of the places, if they can kind of feel like it's part of their world as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sorry, we've been talking about your books, but we haven't actually named them yet. Um, what, are, <laughs> what, are, what are the names of the books and uh, what are the order, what's the order that people should be reading them in? Sure. So book one, actually I have it here. Book one is called Salt. Um, and that's sort of the main entry point into the series. Uh, book two is called Sand and book three is called Soul. Um, and then there's the two prequels, which are Scourge and Seed. And that's book zero and book 0.5. Um, and then there's a book called Savage, which is the origin story for the villain in the main series. Um, awesome. And then the book, the book that I'm releasing in November is called Pause, and that's book four. It picks up after the end of the main trilogy. Cool. Very cool. And I love the the single word S names that Me is consistent too. through the series. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I really... Uh, I'm gonna get canceled for saying this, but I'm so tired of so of books being always of something of something and something. Yeah, I can't I can't stand those titles, and I just wanted to be as far from one of those titles as I possibly could. So I was gotcha. like, I'm gonna go one word, a bit. Yeah, you yeah. know, there's there's definitely a certain expectation when you name your um, when you name the, your book that sort of title, um, mm -hmm. and I feel like you're. Maybe maybe your books relate, but maybe they don't. Um, so maybe let's talk a little bit about the the genre of your book. Um, you've mentioned that your books are dystopian, um, but mm -hmm. you also have two different versions of your books. You've got a YA version, and you've got a, a book that you've labeled as steamy. Uh, can you tell <laughs> yeah. us a little bit more about the about those two and what the differences are? Sure. Yeah. So um, the initial series when I first started writing. I wanted it to be a YA dystopian book, so similar to like Hunger Games, Divergent, Maze Runner, that kind of genre. Um, and actually, when I first started writing, I didn't really want any romance at all in my books. I just, I don't know why, I just like, I didn't, I don't want any romance. Um, in the course of writing the books, I have kind of come around to the fact that like romance is actually kind of fun to write. People seem to like it, and it sells really well. So I wrote a romantic subplot for the YA series. So the YA series is a YA dystopian romance, which I think is pretty straightforward. Like most people know what that is. That's, that's the thing. Um, having then written that romance, I, I then discovered new adult fiction. Um, and new adult is, I guess you could sort of call it like a, a sub branch of YA or it's similar to YA, but basically a new adult the characters are a little older than they are in YA. They're usually between the ages of like 19 and 25. And often there is steamy or spicy or explicit content right there on the page in the book. So Fourth Wing, um, Akatar, uh, series like this, those are all kind of examples of this like new adult genre. And so having discovered that genre, 
um, I was like, I, I kind of like this. And I also wondered if I could write that type of thing. So it really started as, as sort of like a curiosity for myself of like, would I be able to write like a spicy scene? And would that be something I would enjoy? And would it be something that people would want to read? So I went back and I basically wrote some like bonus spicy scenes for the YA books. And my intention was to release them as part of a subscription service. So I was going to do like a bonus content thing for some of my, my readers. And then I kind of just realized that like running a subscription service in addition to everything else is a lot of work. And so I decided not to do that. And so I just put the scenes into the books where they belonged. I aged up the characters by a few years and I released a whole separate edition of the series as a new adult dystopian series. So right now there are two totally separate versions of the series out there in the world. There's the YA series, which has no spice, it's like clean. There's romance in it, but they kiss and that's about as far as it goes. Um, and then there's the new adult version of the series, which has actual explicit spicy scenes right there on the page. Um, and as I suspected, the spicy books definitely sell better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, no surprise there, probably. Yeah, definitely not surprised. And um, But I mean, I think what was really interesting to me in this whole process was that I actually discovered that I actually enjoy writing it. And I, I think that it's a really interesting, like, facet of the characters to include. Um, in, in my mind, like, writing these scenes, these, like, very intimate scenes between these characters was a really interesting way to learn new things about the characters and right. see how they react in these like very vulnerable situations. So it was a really, it was a really interesting experience for me. I don't think I'll do it again. I don't think I would ever again have two completely separate versions of the same series because uh -huh. What I did not think about when I st started this is that then you have to get two covers. Well, I mean, you don't have to, but in order to make it really clear which one is which, I like to have two different covers. I like to be able to market them separately and, and be able to say, like, this is this, this is this, so there's, like, no confusion. Right. So, yeah. So then you do kind of end up having to do kind of, like, if you really want to market them both, you're going to have to end up doing, like, double the marketing, which right. I didn't really think about going into this. So I don't know if I'll do it again. But it's been a really interesting experience, and that's, like, you know, that's, like, what being an indie is about, right? Is yeah. Know, just experimenting and trying Learning things out as you and go. Seeing, what, seeing what works. So have you had any confusion of people picking up what they thought was a YA book and they accidentally grabbed the Steamy book I, too or something? I don't think so. Not so okay. far. Um, <clears throat> for the most part, I have done a lot of my promoting on TikTok where people seem to really like Spice and don't mm -hmm. ever seem to be bummed <laughs> that they're getting it. Um, and my YA readers... Um, some of my first and most like hardcore fans are fans of the YA books. So at this point, I'm mostly continuing writing the YA series just for them because okay. like, you know I want them to be able to keep reading and I, I love them. And um, so far, it hasn't been a problem. I don't anticipate that it will be, but who knows? <laughs> There's still time for it all to go horribly wrong and blow up in my face. Well, if it hasn't yet, you're probably probably on the right track. I, you know, yeah. it's just it's something that I've never heard of any other author doing before, and I'm sure there has. And I wanted to ask you if it's something you've seen before where an author has released two completely separate versions like this. There is one author that I know of that I spoke to before I did this. Her name is Beth. It's either Wordzell or Wordell. Um, and she wrote a YA and an adult version of her series. I haven't read the series, so I don't know if it is like necessarily spicy adult version okay. or what exactly yeah. the difference is, but I assume that those are, those are the differences. Yeah. Okay. I'm learning new stuff every day in this industry as I think we probably all are. So yeah. sometimes I, sometimes people tell me like, yeah, there's tons of this out there and I've just never heard of it. Cause it's not, I don't look for the, the uh, spicy yeah. books myself. I, so. I should maybe take it as a, as a sign from the universe that there aren't more people doing this. <laughs> there's, there's probably a reason for it but i am the kind of person who will not be told and will just go and find out for myself that it's a terrible idea so yeah you know it's a it's not a bad thing to experiment with these things have they like have they both separately done done okay like have you noticed the, a yeah, difference so 
the spicy is definitely doing better, but that's because I have done a lot of promoting of it specifically on TikTok. Um, I actually, in the last like five days, uh, randomly had some videos on TikTok and Instagram kind of blow up in a way that I wasn't expecting. And a lot more people are now reading the books. Um, awesome. So I'm hoping that they're all finding the versions that they want. I try to make it as clear as possible. Like, you know, the spicy ones, I write spicy, like everywhere, explicit scenes, like everywhere that I can to make it very, very clear. Mm -hmm. um, and then I even put, you know, on, on the Amazon listing, I say like, you know, if you want a version of this book that doesn't have spice, you can find it at my website, blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, and I actually did get a comment the other day on a video from someone who said, um, I just downloaded the YA version. Thanks so much for having that no spice version available. That's so great. So it seems like, you know, people who want the, the YA version are finding it, which is great. Cool. Cool. And I, I love that you're, I, it maybe it's a lot of work, but I love that you are giving yourself a way to reach readers who maybe wouldn't have picked up your story otherwise. Um, yeah. I think it's great. That's yeah. the that's the ultimate goal, I think, is to just sort of be able to, and I love both versions of the series equally. Like sometimes I, I go back and I'm like, man, I, I almost just like the YA version better without the spice. Like, but I also, it's so hard. I love, I love them both. And I hope that, you know, people who read them love them as well, equally. Uh, so you mentioned TikTok, and lately you have been getting a lot of traction on TikTok. I've been following you on both TikTok and Instagram for some time, and definitely have seen you going from kind of just dipping your toes in to really seemingly to take off in the last uh, last little while. Um, mm -hmm. What advice would you have for other authors looking to reach more readers on TikTok? I would say, so I definitely... I think that romance does do really well on TikTok and it would be disingenuous of me to say of me for me to pretend otherwise like if you're writing romance or fantasy or YA to some extent um I think those genres do certainly do better on TikTok um but as far as like social media in general I kind of made a I made a decision a while ago when I when I first started that I was just gonna do exactly what I wanted to do and I was gonna have fun with it. That is like my main my main criteria because I think like there's a lot of advice out there that makes it sound like if you do things a certain way or if you put your if you present yourself in a certain way or if you write a certain type of thing or if you do x y and z you will be a successful indie author and i just don't know if that's necessarily true and at the end of the day if you're not having fun doing it there's literally no point because right. you know even having you know like i've started to have a little bit of some some small amount of success and like i'm selling some books and that's great but like it's not anywhere near enough to like support me or anything like that so at the end of the day, if I'm not having fun, like, what is the point? Um, so I basically, I basically told myself, I'm just going to be me. I'm going to be as me as I possibly can be in everything that I do. My books are very much like, here's me, here's my whole life, right? So I decided I was going to carry all of that over into my branding and my marketing, and my social media presence, and, and just put me out there. Um, and I, it seems to work. Like I think people respond to people being real and just putting themselves out there. People, people like that and they like to connect with a real person. So if I had any advice, I guess that would be what it was. It's just like be you and have fun with it. Do stuff that's fun. Um, right. when I first started on TikTok, actually, <clears throat> um, the way that I very first started to find any kind of traction at all on the app was literally by, I would just go and I would follow all the accounts, all the book talk accounts that TikTok recommended to me every day. So like 30 or 50 accounts a day I was following. And then anyone that followed me back, I would reach out through a direct message and I would say, hey, I have this book. It was already released in Amazon at the time and it wasn't doing very well. And I basically was like, hey, I'll give you a free ebook if you leave a review on Amazon. So I was basically kind of basically soliciting ARC reviews through TikTok. And 
that was how I met some of my favorite readers, made some real connections on the app and started actually meeting real people who then became like my super fans and my readers and evangelists and people who like when I have a release coming up, will make videos about my book and post them and, and share my stuff with people. So that would be my second piece of advice, I guess, which is like, don't be afraid to reach out to people and, and make real connections with readers on the app. Um, I always like to remind myself that it's social media, not just media. So there is a social aspect to it and you can, you can get farther, I think, by actually talking to people. Right. No, and that is that's great advice. I think actually, um, yeah, connecting with the people on the other end because it is, I think, meant to be a conversation and not yeah. just you know, here's my not just saying here's my book and hoping people will pick it up. I, yeah. I love and I love that. It's, it's great because I have I have one reader who I was just <clears throat> talking to. She did some uh, beta read of the book I'm about to release, and then she texted me and she was like. I keep thinking about the new relationship that you just started for the main character in this book. And I'm like, I know I try, I'm thinking about it too. Like, I don't know what to do, you know? So now I'm kind of talking with her and I'm gauging how she feels about it. And I'm taking that into consideration for when I write the next book, like, okay, so how does she's like, she really likes the books and, and she's one of my favorite readers. So I'm going to listen to what she has to say. And I'm actually going to consider that when I, when I go to write the next book, which is cool. Like it's fun. Yeah, you know, and I don't know if readers realize that us as authors, especially indie authors, love hearing from our readers about what they think about our books, whether that yeah. be in reviews or even just comments on social media. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And some of, you know, some of those connections that I've built on TikTok as well have, you know, inspired that same sort of thing where, you know, they're asking me questions and I'm like, as the, you know, how cool as an author to be able to talk about your book with someone yes. on the other side of the world. I think yeah. it's I think it's the coolest thing. Yeah, it's really cool. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit more about dystopian fiction. We've talked about a little bit of how it plays a role in the world of your story, um, mm -hmm. but how do you navigate a genre uh, of dystopia in respects to climate change? Are you doing research ahead of time? What are you What are you ensuring that you're including? What kind of tropes are you including to meet readers' expectations and mm -hmm. you know come across kind of genuine in your in the story um i definitely do some research i was actually <clears throat> i was talking to my dad about this today because he reads my books and he very much is more into the sort of like science and um of it than he is into you know the romance and the relationships and i'm always like dad <laughs> the science is kind of secondary for me like it's there to support the story i want it to be i don't want it to be so wrong that it pulls you out of the story but i'm also not going like super heavy into it it's really more of like that's there to support the the characters and their and their relationships and their character development um but i do i do enjoy researching um somewhat and getting a little bit into um like there's teleportation in my books and there's sort of very very surface level touching on like quantum mechanics but like not really um and i think a lot of the climate stuff comes just from my own anxieties honestly right. um and and me thinking about how i feel about the world and where it's going um as far as tropes i definitely try to i don't love tropes um i like to I like to try and think of ways to include them, but like subvert them a little bit. Um, I, you know, so there's like dead parents, of course, because in YA dystopia, everyone's parents have to be dead. But right. <clears throat> I didn't want my main character to be like a Harry Potter dead parent figure. So she's got very loving, very supportive parents, but her cool. love interest is an orphan. So I'm trying to like hit certain tropes, but in a way that's just like a little bit sideways from from maybe what you would expect. Yeah. Um, and then I think when I wrote the first book, I didn't really know anything at all about writing or or whatever. So I think that book is maybe a a little bit a little bit less tropey or a little bit weirder than maybe some of the later books. By the time I got to like book three. I had a little bit of a better idea about 
storytelling and about how to include certain tropes. So, and a lot of people tell me that book three is like their favorite book. So nice. tropes, tropes are useful, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, you've got, you know, they save the world and um, they fall in love while doing it. And there's an evil government. Um, there's, what else? God, I don't know. I'm trying to think now and I'm, and I'm coming up blank, but yeah. there's definitely tropes in there that, that you'd recognize. Yeah. And you know, and really, really tropes are really a way just to um, communicate with the reader, what the, you know, a lot of what the book's mm -hmm. about too. So I, th I yeah. think it's great. And I think it's great that you, you know, you included them in maybe a way that's not typical um, because mm -hmm. it, that keeps things fresh, but you're still able to have that conversation with the reader. So yeah. I really enjoy it. We covered a lot in that question, but going back to including the, sci the science as well, I think, you know, just especially why dystopia is, is really usually driven a lot more by the character journey than, you know, the science of what actually happened. There's always usually, you know, uh, here's kind of what happened, but that's not the point of this, right. of this story. Right. Um, right. I did something. So my first series was a Y dystopia series as well. Um, mm -hmm. And it, but it's, and it's about artificial intelligence. Mm. But there's, you know, but there's magic. There's, you know, there's all sorts of stuff in there. That's not, it's not about the artificial intelligence. That's just kind of the backdrop of it. Yeah. That's funny. I'm, I'm considering writing about artificial intelligence for my next series, actually. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a lot there. Maybe we'll have to talk about that a bit after. <laughs> <laughs> what, who was your favorite character to write in the series and what made them special? Oh, man. That's a great question. I mean, I want to say the main character, Bird, but I actually really love writing her love interest, Sargo. Um, he, I, I try to write all of my characters like very complicated and, and with multiple things that they're dealing with and all kinds of problems and Maybe I'm piling a lot on them, I guess you could say. Um, but so <clears throat> Sargo is great because in the first trilogy, he's he's a foil for Bird. So it's like an opposites attract kind of romance where she's this sort of like chaotic disaster. And he's this like very, I don't want to say uptight, but like very put together, logical, tries to do everything by the book guy and he's got his own reasons for being that way that are driven by you know past traumas and all that stuff um but then in the in book four which is now the beginning of a new series i'm telling it from his point of view and now i get to dig into him unraveling and basically not being that like you know uptight logical in control person that he's like he's presented as in books one through three. He's like, nice. he's like the stable rock in books one through three. And then you get to book four and you discover that like, actually underneath he's sort of falling apart as well, just like everybody else's. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's been really fun to write and really um, makes me feel like I'm, I'm being fair to the character and, and really writing them in a way that's like thoughtful and giving them their whole due if that makes right. sense. Yeah, you're I giving them layers. Yeah, I don't like yeah. any character to just be there as a like a device for yeah. other characters. Yeah. I love yeah, that sounds great. And those are the characters that resonate the most, I think, with readers, is when yeah. you, know, you, you don't want to just throw in a stereotype character without any depth to them, right? So giving, mm -hmm. them, giving them those issues and different layers of personality, I think, is what, what makes them resonate. So what, what emotional impact do you hope to have on your readers as they're reading your books? Uh, I just want people to cry. And <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think I, um, I don't know. Yeah, I want people to feel sometimes hopeless, but then maybe by the end, I actually haven't decided yet if I want this whole series to end on a hopeful note or if I just want to just destroy everyone's uh, confidence Ooh. in the future. Um, I'm, I'm still figuring it out. Um, yeah. Like by the end of book three, I sort of ended book three on like a bit of a hopeful note, but now there's, I have three more books to play with and crush everybody's dreams. So um, I want it to be an emotional roller coaster. You know? <laughs> and I think it kind of is. Um, it's, 
it's definitely up and down. Yep. That's so good. When the reader doesn't, when the writer doesn't know if it's if it's how it's going to end, then the re- the reader sure won't. And you're, <laughs> you're I genuinely, a lot. I am like sort of in a bit of a position right now where I've just finished book four and I'm going like, okay, what am I going to do? I don't actually <laughs> know how this ends at all. Oh God. Yeah. We'll get there. When, we'll figure it out. Uh, absolutely. Well, it's amazing when you start on the next book, you've, you've spent so much time on book two or three or whatever it is. And, you, and then you, and then you're staring at that blank page of book four and you're like, I actually don't know what's happening now. <laughs> Been there. Yeah. Been there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're, you've got a couple more books in this series, but um, what can readers expect from you next? Do you have something else that you're working on on the side or in the background or? Yeah, so I did actually start another series earlier this year or last year. Um, and then I put it on the back burner to kind of finish writing the Colossic series. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking about maybe trying to query that book again, because okay. I queried Salt after I'd first written it, like uh, whenever that was. Got rejected by everybody, obviously. Decided to self-publish it. Um, but now having written a bunch more books after that and feeling like I have a little bit of a better handle on my prose and story structure and all that stuff, I wonder if that experience of querying might be different this time around. So I'm curious. So I think I'm going to try and finish up that book, which I think would be book one in a new series, which would be like, I think, a YA fantasy series, like an urban fantasy series. Um, And I might try and query that. So that's sort of what I'm looking at. So I have two more books in the Thalassic series to finish up, which I think I'm going to do like basically in the spring of next year. So I hope by next June that the Thalassic series will be, it won't be done because I still know I have actually more than that to write, but (laughs) it'll be done for now. Um, And then I'll try and finish, wrap up this other book um, by the end of next year and start querying it. So, yeah, that's that's kind of where cool. I'm at at the moment. Beyond that, I did have plans to start a subscription service, but I honestly just don't know if I can keep up with the having to write things to that schedule. Yeah, I hear you. It, yeah, I probably could, but I'm nervous. I'm nervous that I wouldn't be able to. So. Right. Yeah, and I I almost feel like you have to with depending on depending on your workload and you know how how you put things out. I would need to heavily front load that anyway. I would need to have yeah. a lot a lot prepared ahead of time in order to pull that off. But yeah, yeah. And I I did sort of put feelers out to my mailing list to see if anyone would be interested even in that kind of thing, and I didn't really get any response mm-hmm. for it. So until I until people are asking me for it, I probably won't do it. Right. Yeah, there's always, you know, there's always, it feels like as indie authors, there's always the next shiny thing that we're supposed to be paying attention to. It seems like subscription seems to be the having its moment, but yeah. um, my I, my workflow, I, I don't think I could do that. I'm My process is is too long, I, I, mm-hmm. I guess, to do that. Like I, by the time I get to the end of a book, I have to go back and change five other things. So if I had to pump out three chapters every few weeks, I'd it would be a nightmare for, I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd write myself into a corner pretty quick if I did that. Yeah. 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 Plus I do so much revising and editing and I actually really love yeah. editing. I think it might be my favorite part of the process. So right. to have written something on like a first draft and then just put it out in the world and have people read it, I would just, I don't know. I'd, I'd go back and be like, Oh no, no, this is terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't do that either. My, my drafts are a mess. So I relate to you there. <laughs> um, so Liz, this is the greatest podcast in the multiverse. Can you tell me about how in a parallel universe, a different choice might have shaped another version of your life? That's so funny. I'm literally writing about parallel universes in the ooh, ooh. Um, So I was thinking about this today, and I think maybe the choice that has most, the choice that has like most shaped my life to be what it is right now. Um, was the decision to, so I used to be a musician a long time ago, and I quit music and started teaching myself to code with the intention of buying this boat and coming on this trip. So I would say in a parallel universe, I maybe, I might still be doing music. 
and I like would not have made that decision to quit music and to pursue software. And I definitely wouldn't be where I am right now. Where would I be? I don't know. I might have been somewhat successful as a musician. I guess, you know, I guess we'll never know. That's a, right. a parallel Lizzie somewhere. Very cool. Doing that. Rock, rocking out. Or was, or was it a rock musician? I guess I shouldn't assume. But Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah, that, I mean, that definitely is a life-altering decision that has taken you literally around the world. So very, <laughs> very cool. And you wouldn't be writing yeah. about pirates and water worlds and all that. I love it. Yeah. Very cool, Liz. So can you tell our listeners where they can find you and how they can get a copy of your books? The new adult spicy editions of the eBooks are free in KU. So you can get those there. There are also paperbacks of those available on Amazon. There are also paperbacks available on my bookshop at shop.lizshifton.com. So you can find, I sell basically like a deluxe version of the spicy paperbacks there that have maps and have bonus author notes and a couple of like bonus illustrations. Um, and that's also the only place that you can buy the YA version. So if you're looking for the clean YA version, you need to go to shop.listshifting.com. Um, you can get the spicy version pretty much anywhere, but you can also get it at shop.listshifting.com. And I will link all of those in the show notes. Um, let us, or what, what are your Instagram and TikTok handles so people can find you on there as well? Oh, yeah. Um, just Liz Shifton author everywhere. Wonderful. Awesome, Liz. Thank you so much for joining me today. It was a lot of fun to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This is a really good time. Cool. We will chat with you again soon. Thank you for joining me. If you enjoyed the show, like and subscribe on your favorite podcast app or on YouTube. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Greatest Podcast in the Multiverse. As well, you can help support the show by supporting me on Patreon. For as little as $5 a month, you can get early access to the show as well as submit your questions for my upcoming guests. I hope to see you next time. Bye now.